The next group of organisms to consider are those which are more complex relative to the groups we've been discussing so far. In each case, they have well-developed physiological organs and are in most cases sophisticated in terms of their sensory and neural systems that allow them to have roles as herbivores, carnivores and omnivores. In each group, just like the previous groups we've been discussing, these organisms play an important series of roles in tropical coastal ecosystems today. Before we begin discussing the more complex invertebrates, we need to mention an important split which occurred in the animal kingdom several hundred million years ago. While all of the groups we're going to discuss now have well-developed organs and have similar ways of solving problems, it appears that there were two lines of evolution uh, within the animal kingdom. On one hand, we have mollusks, annelids and arthropods, which share similarities in the way they develop and in the origin of certain tissues and uh, other aspects of their body plan. In contrast to this, we have echinoderms and chordates like ourselves, which develop in subtly different ways and have different origins in terms of key tissues. The first group are known as the protostomes, while the second group are referred to as the deuterostomes. Well, mollusks are a prominent protostome group with tens of thousands of species found in and around tropical coastal ecosystems. There are a range of different types of mollusks, including octopus and squids, bivalves and clams, snails and sea slugs, and a range of other often ancient creatures. Mollusks have an open circulatory system in which blood is pumped around a large cavity in their body uh, without having arteries and veins. They tend to have a sophisticated set of sensory systems and well-developed and advanced brains in many cases. And of course, octopus and squid are exemplary in this respect, with sophisticated eyes, brains, and a level of intelligence that rivals that seen in vertebrates. Now, some bivalves within the phylum mollusca can get extremely large and are also symbiotic with the same dinoflagellates as corals. Annelids, or segmented worms, are a prominent group on tropical coastal ecosystems. The most important group in the ocean within the segmented or annelid worms are the polychaete worms. And they have a great variety of uh, different ways of deriving nutrition. Uh, some of them actively crawl around using fleshy parapodia, hunting small invertebrates, while others, such as Christmas tree worms, have complicated appendages on their heads, which they use to capture small particles from the water floating by. And in this respect, they're particle feeders. There are still other annelids which uh, burrow and spend most of their time collecting detritus and are important components of mudflats, sandy beaches and estuarine regions. The next major group of protostome invertebrates belong to the phylum Arthropoda. The most important group of arthropods within tropical coastal ecosystems belongs to the subphylum Crustacea. Now the Crustacea include uh, easily recognisable organisms such as crabs, prawns, lobsters, barnacles and sandhoppers. And like the other major groups of protostome invertebrates, crustacean species number in the thousands and are involved in a large number of interactions with other organisms. Many crustaceans are filter feeders, while still others are herbivores feeding on algae. And there are a great many crustaceans that are quite voracious predators. Now within any tropical coastal ecosystem, there are literally thousands of intricate and fascinating species of crustaceans. Another group of arthropods, which are not crustaceans but are well known, are the sea spiders. These fascinating and shy creatures are found every now and then around tropical coastal ecosystems. Moving from the protostomes to the deuterostome invertebrates, we come across the echinoderms, which include sea cucumbers, starfish, crinoids and brittle stars. There are also a great variety of different roles that echinoderms play within tropical coastal ecosystems. Some echinoderms, such as sea cucumbers, play important roles as detrital feeders. Others, such as crinoids, are filter feeders, collecting particles out of the water column using their tube feet. Others are herbivores, 
Sea urchins, for example, have a powerful set of jaws that they use to eat macroalgae or seaweeds and can be numerous members of tropical coastal ecosystems. And still other echinoderms, such as starfish, can be voracious predators. One that is particularly important on coral reefs is the crown of thorns starfish. This starfish has caused problems on the Indo-Pacific reef systems through its enormous appetite for living coral tissue and its tendency to outbreak in very large numbers. The last group of organisms within the animal kingdom that I'll talk about here are the chordates. This is the phylum of organisms that we also belong to. The most primitive group of chordates are the tunicates. These are sedentary organisms that sit on the bottom of the ocean and filter the sea around them, capturing particles. They are related to other chordates via structures that are found within their larvae. In this respect, they have pharyngeal pouches, a holodorsal nerve tube, and a stiff rod down their back called a notochord. And these features, uh, which relate to similar structures in vertebrate groups, pull together the chordates. Tunicates are often brightly coloured and are a favourite subject for underwater photographers. One of the most prominent subphylums within the phylum chordata are the vertebrates. This group includes organisms that share the same chordate features, as well as a well-developed bony backbone and gill slits at some time during their development. There are four major classes of vertebrates which are found in and around tropical coastal ecosystems. And like the other groups we've been discussing, there's no way we can do justice to each of these important vertebrate groups. But let me introduce them here. If you are interested, I recommend further reading if you want to understand these important groups within tropical and coastal ecosystems. Well, fish are one of the most diverse groups of vertebrates on the planet with over 32,000 species. Now it's estimated that around 10,000 of these species are found in the shallow tropical waters associated with mangroves, coral reefs and seagrass beds. With a bewildering variety of species, there are fish in almost every trophic role. Some fish are particle feeders, some are herbivores, while still others are scavengers and predators. Here are just a few of the fish you will see when you encounter tropical coastal ecosystems. We will be considering fish as important parts of coral reef and mangrove assemblages later in lectures by Professor Peter Mumby. Reptiles also play a prominent role within tropical coastal ecosystems. Representing organisms that have re-evolved for life in the ocean, reptiles are air-breathing vertebrates, which, for the most part, still have to lay their eggs on dry land. While this is the case for most reptiles, a few sea snake species have solved this problem by evolving live birth at sea, hence reducing their need to ever come ashore. Locations such as Heron Island represent important nesting grounds for marine reptiles like sea turtles. Each year, hundreds of turtles come ashore here to lay eggs, which hatch a month or so later. Seabirds are highly visible members of tropical coastal ecosystems, which feed primarily or exclusively at sea and use coastal areas for feeding and reproduction. Many islands are used by seabirds for reproduction given that they have very low numbers of potential predators. Unfortunately, the introduction of cats and rats in many of these areas has led to the loss of seabird nesting sites on many of these islands. Seabird nesting on Heron Island has been able to continue given the careful management of the park, especially when it comes to pests like cats and rats. Marine mammals are regular visitors to tropical coastal ecosystems. Whales, dolphins and dugongs spend significant time close to these ecosystems and in many cases use them for winter habitat and for reproduction. Here at Heron Island, for example, an annual migration of humpback whales occurs each year passing through the Wistari Channel just offshore. These whales spend their summers in Antarctica and migrate to the central Great Barrier Reef when the winter comes. Mating and calving of whales occurs during this annual migration to the Great Barrier Reef. Well, as with many of these groups, 
We don't do them justice with the small amount of time we can spend on them. Take a look now at the following diagram and see if you can take the phylogenetic challenge. During this lecture, we've moved through a very large number of organisms which would normally be the focus of their own courses. As we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, there are many opportunities worldwide to continue studying these different groups. Many research stations like Heron Island also offer courses which you may consider taking. In the next lecture, we will be considering many of the organisms that you've been introduced to today in the context of coral reef ecosystems. Well, that concludes our rather rapid march through the animal, plants and microbes that you find associated with tropical coastal ecosystems. In the next exercise, we take a boulder from the intertidal region of a coral reef and ask the question, how many species can we find? I think you'll find the number quite surprising. <laughs>